Welcome back, and to start our coverage of the international news, I unfortunately have a couple of sad stories. The first concerns a lovely man and a quite ridiculously talented rider whom I had the pleasure of interviewing a, a few years back. Christian Pfeiffer committed suicide recently at the age of 51 after a glorious enduro riding career. And before that, as a motocross and trials rider, he conquered the insanely difficult Red Bull hair scramble at uh, the Erzberg Rodeo four times. Only two riders have ever been more successful at this legendary event. He also won multiple stunt riding world championships and he will be best remembered by many, many thousands of fans who witnessed him in action as BMW's trick riding supremo at exhibitions he performed in over 90 countries across the globe. Fantastically talented, blessed with a loving family that I also had the pleasure of meeting, and incredibly successful, he still succumbed to mental health issues. Men's mental health is something that too many of us are wary of discussing, but it affects many more people than we realise, so please remember that help is at hand should you need it. Don't be afraid to ask for help, and don't be afraid to offer help if anyone close to you seems to be struggling. The second sad story is upsetting in a very different way. You may remember our occasional updates about the saga of Norton motorcycles over the past couple of years and its CEO, Stuart Garner. Without wishing to be too judgmental, this lowlife basically misused hundreds of people's pensions funds with which he was entrusted as a financial advisor. The money was illegally directed into Norton as he attempted to bring the deceased manufacturer back to life, although along the way he seemed to be living the high life, mixing with celebs and politicians, drinking expensive champagne, driving fast cars, you know the type of thing. And then one day, despite all the warning signs, the 210 million rand pension pot was gone and a lot of people have had their retirement, basically the rest of their lives, utterly ruined because this heartless egomaniac took them to the cleaners. The British justice system, in all its blind wisdom, decided the punishment for this sickening crime would be eight months prison time. Suspended. Yeah, the punishment somehow almost seems more sick than the crime. It appears that he's effectively got away with it then, and the courts have sent a message out that if you commit theft on a grand enough scale, rather than just nicking something from a shop or a house, then the scales of justice will weigh your upper middle class credentials and decide that they outweigh the scope of the misery you've caused your fellow but uh, lesser working class citizens. What a joke. And what a sad story, and so I'm going to attempt to lighten the mood again with news of the revival of some more famous motorcycle brands. The first is Can-Am. Yes, the Canadian company that is part of the uh, massive Bombardier group, or more accurately BRP, Bombardier Recreational Products, that is perhaps more famous, at least recently, for making everything from snowmobiles to planes, and of course its range of three-wheelers that we've even tested here on the bike show. Well, if you're younger than, I was going to say Don or myself, but actually it's just me, then you might not realise that Can-Am also used to be a big player in the off-road bike world. In 1970, Bombardier had bought the Austrian engine manufacturer Rotax, and by 1973 they developed and were racing their own motocross bikes, going on to take, eventually, the AMA 250 crown. The mid-1970s saw a lot of success for the programme, but by the end of the decade it was, well, it was all over as the company focused on other, more profitable areas of the leisure industry. Well, that two-wheeled history is about to be revived with a new range of bikes that you should be able to buy within the next two years. The difference is that the entire lineup is now going to be electric, which is Perhaps not too much of a surprise, given that BRP bought out some of the assets of Alta Motors, including some intellectual property rights. This was a Californian electric motorcycle manufacturer that went bust back in 2018. It seems they've been putting that knowledge to good use. If you've been watching our rubbish for a long time, then you may remember us being at the EICMA Expo in Milan at the back end of... 2019 when we brought you the first motorcycle to ever wear the Aston Martin badge. Manufactured in France on the outskirts of Toulouse by the same guys who were also responsible for the equally 
distinctly English Mark Bruff Superior, the AMB 001 is very obviously a development of the same ingredients used to such good effect in the range of Bruff Superiors. A new, more modern aesthetic and the addition of a turbo to the big V-twin give you a track day special that now, just over two and a half COVID interrupted years after its debut, is starting to be delivered finally to the 100 customers who've paid somewhere just shy of 2 million Rand for the pleasure of owning or perhaps investing in this piece of Aston Martin history. If they do dare to ride their investment, they will be rewarded with 183 turbocharged horsepower in a package with a dry weight of 180 kilos. So it should blow most of the four-wheeled Aston Martins that these customers will undoubtedly already have in their garages. Or should that be garages? And to finish this week's episode, I'm going to revert, as we did last week, to answering a frequently asked question from our viewers. And this one concerns the sarcasm with which I treated the new Brabus, which some of you didn't seem to appreciate. You might remember that Brabus, famous for bringing us blinged up versions of mainly Mercedes cars, I think it is, and often adding a serious dose of performance in the process, well, they've just released their first bike. 150 examples are being produced of their reskinning of KTM's 1290 Super Duke R Evo, the new one with the semi-active suspension. The price will be up around 800,000 Rand or so, about twice what you'd pay for the KTM, for which you get no extra performance, but some fancy wheels, a new headlight, some scoops and vents, and a lot of carbon bits and bobs. I had the temerity to suggest that I thought this was a bit of a cheek, at least price-wise, for a version of the Super Duke R that looks more like the kind of modification Husqvarna would make to rebadge the same model. I received many disparaging comments about my apparent lack of wealth and my general attitude to these limited edition bikes and some suggestions of self-fornication because I just don't understand, apparently. Let me just say in my defense that I wouldn't have been quite so negative had there been some kind of meaningful improvement to the performance stats, perhaps like the Aston Martin we've just mentioned, with the addition of a ruddy great turbo or something equally bonkers. I actually like many of these sorts of bikes, but if I had, and I obviously don't, the necessary funds, I would probably head somewhere like MV Augusta, where the Rush, to me, offers a more flamboyant, Italian supercar level of extravagance for that sort of money. Although, ultimately forced to part with such a huge sum, I think I'd actually travel deeper into Italy, to the East Coast in fact, and avail myself of uh, Bimota Tazy H2 that has significantly more performance, seriously more striking looks, but would admittedly relieve me of about another 200,000 Rand since it has a cool 1 million Rand asking price. And as for rarity, I'm pretty sure Bimota hasn't, or indeed won't be selling, 150 of those anytime soon. Although I could be wrong. If anybody knows, please do tell. And on that note of what I hope is a little bit of personal redemption, we'll say cheers for now and see you again next week on The Bike Show.